So welcome to session nine, which is called Theoretical Contributions to the Science of Creative Thinking. Our first speaker is Astrubal Borges. He's a researcher at the post-graduation program in human development process and health. He's a teacher at the bachelor at the Organizational Communication Department of the University of Brazil, and his research is about creativity and communication under the basis of a social and cultural approach. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm proposing uh, this. I could make an evocation if we have more time, but go down, down. down. Thank you. So you are quite aware of the sixties, I believe that, and particularly the fifth and sixth one. And are related, mo mostly related with communication. All of them are in the end. Then, what could be the point? Okay, if I find it pointless, doesn't uh, really matter. <coughs> Is it a personal issue? Is it social, cultural, interactional? So, that is what it's about a kind of proposal adding to, the exi to an existing typology. Keywords, worlds, creativity, communicational value, okay, this uh, as the thing from uh, of purpose, the communicational value was a term used by Howard Gruber. And that's uh, when I came back to read some classics like him in the literature, I got interested by this topic of purpose uh, let's say, le last year, then I began to develop this research. Actions, okay, it's a kind of uh, action-based thing, okay, I refer to uh, a, 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 a term, uh, how, can, how can I say, I borrow from all others like Vlad, okay, he, wa he once told me in an email, okay, it's an action-based, and I really enjoyed that term, mm -hmm. okay, and purpose, oh, sorry, I'm going back. So, the first question, can purpose predi predict creativity? Then I had some data, okay, from an old research. I made, a, uh, some years ago, a task of divergent, divergent thinking, uh, a, a, a thought, okay, uh, to some university students from a colleague in another city, uh, inspired by one I developed with my own students. And I was thinking, okay, I could suppose they were most guided by feelings and emotions to develop their answers, which wasn't true in the end. It depended mostly on the group of students, on the environment, and most of the factors. This is an example, a uh, registration of the process by one of the respondents, okay? Because uh, after giving the task, uh, like what, uh, what would you, would you put inside this sack? Okay, uh, they could put anything they want, and she, that, that girl would put peace, okay, she, uh, and the, the abstractness of the concept could uh, allow her to develop this. And then she, uh, she took a diary, spent one week okay, to develop this prototype, and make the, regis the registration. I don't have all the images. I think I, I wouldn't have the proper time. Uh, uh, we began with 200 students. It, it uh, went down to 160 because the, the group of architecture didn't want to participate in all the research. It meant for them one more task. It meant more work for them. And the, their course was very hard. Of course, I had to understand it. Okay, so they, they were left from, and until, until the last stage, just 21, okay, 29, okay, answered the, to the question. And the focus on that moment wasn't really on purpose. Then I came back to, the, to, the, to those data to uh, ask, uh, what, what can I learn about purpose? Purpose. Then, thanks to James Kaufman yesterday, the question can be changed. Okay, can creativity predict pur pur purposes? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm making a, uh, the, giving the credit okay, to, the, to, the, to this. 
So the Judds agree with their pairs, okay? There are three groups of Judds uh, ju ju uh, uh, to, to uh, let's say, evaluate, okay? Uh, uh, creativity, relevance, and purpose. Uh, and they could be compared. They have an agreement. However, their comments, okay? They were free to comment uh, by, by looking at the productions. Uh, are, uh, can make contradictory the evaluation of the products are according to those criteria, okay, when we look at the comments. Because according to what I was supposing, each domain, they were, um, okay, uh, no. They were fashion, uh, design, fashion, advertisement, and cinema. And they meant the task differently. Okay, I could see that, maybe they couldn't. They didn't know, okay, they were di from different domains. Okay, they, 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 the judges didn't, didn't know. So for the future, I propose to, uh, with this reflection, with the review of the literature, a uh, longitudinal study to investigate youth pur 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 purpose, sorry, during the development of, the, of projects at university. It could also apply to a project in organizations, okay? It could also apply, but I propose this by looking at uh, how the, this, this stage work to develop another, okay? Maybe I could take one year to, to, to collect the data, and if, if they are meant to be creative in, the, in their tasks, okay? I, I should ask them in the beginning and be, and be there to, uh, to collect those data, those data, sorry. So components, just summarizing a little bit. Creativity is made of knowledge, affection, and purpose by looking at Gruber. Developed by communicational actions, okay, uh, constituents of the history of individual and societies. So it's a developmental approach. What interests me more is the relation between individual and environment by their products by, by their, their production, okay? So if I leave the typology, if I leave the, all the, this number of P's, uh, I, I don't think I'll miss that much. Can just be a typology, okay? Uh, with person and environment uh, mediated by, by actions, mediated by productions, the problem can be solved, okay? Uh, it's, uh, that is not really a problem. Meaningful, stable in time and beyond the self, purpose become deep, and long-term guides capable of making action, actions and outcomes more valuable. That's why the parallel can begin. I can't say they, 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 they make someone more or less creative, but I can investigate it and tell, what can, uh, tell about what can interfere on, on, on that interactions. Okay, I can, can find different answers, answers, and that's the challenge. Okay, that's still the challenge. Coming soon, I will just present that, that uh, figure I began to work in, okay? They, it, will, it will be filled with other names, with other concepts, okay? Lots of issues to deal with, I agree, okay? But we, uh, of course, we can choose two of them, three of them each time, or each stage, during each stage of the research, this pentagram, let's say. Okay, so I began now to try to organize my, uh, myself. I don't, I, may, maybe it's, it's still uh, a challenge. There are more, uh, uh, such a complexity. At that moment, I'm in this triangle, communication, purpose, and creativity, mostly of them, but they cannot be isolated of the others. So it's interactional. I didn't put directions, but they are uh, in, 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 mo in most of the directions. Now I'm studying, waiting for contributions. I know uh, that the, those data I presented to, uh, to you won't answer uh, enough my questions. Okay, I'm aware of this, and I'll develop another research by looking at them. Okay, that, that, that's the, the aim at the moment. I wouldn't say the purpose because the purpose is mu much more than this. Okay. Thank you so much. Questions? Thank you so much, and I think it's such an important topic. Um, so I have a couple of questions. I mean, I have. I think it's becoming increasingly important the whole notion of purpose. 
I have a student doing a PhD with me on looking at creating engaging curriculum and more purposeful curriculum for disengaged youth because um, there's a lot of um, climate change anxiety, for example, in Australia. People are wondering whether there's any point in getting educated because the world is going to end in 12 years, according to a lot of young people, which is kind of astounding. And so I, th I think that it's a very important area to look at. But I also, and, and it definitely links to motivation and and creativity and um, emotion, because people, if they're feeling emotional about something, are more likely to act on it and want to do something purposeful. But my question to you is also, have you studied the purpose in the teachers? Because I think that one of the things that motivates us as teachers is this fact that we see the changes, that we see the transformation happen in front of us. People, we see students popping like popcorn when they're inspired in front of us. And so have, have you looked at that? Because you know their teachers are also playing a role in this intergenerational social contract uh, to help make the world a better place called education. Uh, I guess I should, okay? Even in the last stage of this conference in Geneva, some people made important comments. We should look at the teachers and at the interactions. At this moment, I was considering the students, but uh, I guess I should look at the teachers because the thing about purpose are this. The, uh, that, that girl, for example, she wanted to share peace with other people, okay? She, she, she called peace pills. It's a, ki a kind of coconut, uh, uh, let, let's say, uh, sweets ma made in Brazil, which is very good, okay? When homemade, it, it's very good, but it was a symbol for her. And she related during the process. I was sad, I was feeling lonely, and I saw, I meant the task as a way of changing this. Oh my God, she was reading the literature, okay? Uh, she, was, she was not because she was just beginning her course. She didn't know this uh, already. I, may, I could make an interview by, uh, uh, on distance, and she told me about it, and she wrote so much about it. And uh, I can suppose at the moment, when you have a big cause okay, to engage in, it can be favorable, but not for everyone, even because everyone uh, that doesn't have. Okay, I, I can see how I can be there to see. And it's important, it's an important suggestion to look at the teachers and at the interaction, of course, because the environment will take this. Thank you. Other questions? You. It's, it's not really a question, it's fantastic. I, I love this direction as Drubal. We talked about it, but I don't know if I mentioned um, there is another source of inspiration you might be interested in, in the social representations literature. Uh, Bauer and Gaskell had this model of representation which actually is a theory of communication, so it does relate to your thing, and they, and they called it the project, the representational project. So it, it, it starts with a P, so it must be also interesting <laughs> and relevant, but purpose and project can be, can be something, yeah, there is a commonality there. There. I, I can share the reference later. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I, I have many thanks to give to Vlad, okay? Uh, he was my supervisor in the postdoctoral research uh, and, and, and so on. I, I'm always uh, uh, calling him and asking reference, uh, what about this? And uh, I have many thanks to give to him. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm down, right? So we're going to continue to our second speaker, uh, Lewis Ellison. He's a lecturer, designer, actor, researcher, and public speaker with experience across a number of creative disciplines and roles. He currently teaches and studies at the University of Lincoln, focusing on the theories and ideas around creati creativity. Please welcome Lewis. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. So I'm going to be talking about ethnography as a creativity research method. Um, I have just started a PhD, so I am in the first two months of that, and I thought I would come here to talk a bit <laughs> about um, the methods that I'm planning on using and hopefully take ethnography and put it in the context of creativity research and why it may be a viable thing for some people to consider that maybe aren't into that kind of thing, the social sciences, blah, blah, blah. So what is ethnography? Simply put, it's the study of tribes, habits, and cultures. It's a look into the social world 
to try and make sense of cultural phenomena. So we could consider creativity as a cultural phenomena, and going forwards, I'm going to try and contextualize that for you. The benefit of ethnography as a research method for this topic in particular is it establishes a vivid social context. So what is the space around creativity? Not just what's going on in the heads, but what's going on in the heads of people around, the culture around you, the context that you're in, the discipline that you're in, and how do those things define creative action. So the benefit of it, again, is it overcomes issues with just simple question and answer methodologies. So it observes participants. It takes note of the surrounding around them. It takes note of the sounds, the people, the influences that may, might change them. And it highlights the importance of observing and witnessing day-to-day -day life in regards to creative stuff rather than just asking about it. So in terms of going to creativity and why ethnography might be useful, I'm going to establish a bit about creativity to begin with. So across four different texts, it's referred to as a socio-cultural construct, an innovative idea, personal genius, or the ability to transfer knowledge from one setting to another. So that's just a drop in the ocean, but all of these are non-exclusive, but also very different ideas on what the topic is. There seems to be a, somewhat of a misconsensus on creativity. So in an investigation of 90 articles on creativity, it discovered that only 38% offered a conclusive definition of the subject. So that means even the people researching it are scared of defining the very thing they're talking about, which means as someone coming into the field two months into a PhD, doing a lot of reading on this, you've got some people not even saying what it is, and a lot of other people saying things but disagreeing with other people, going, well, it's this in my context, I'm a musician, it does this, and then you've got neuroscientists going, well, it's this part of the brain functioning. And none of them really talk to each other or kind of take example of things beyond themselves. They're all very insular. So that's not to say there aren't similarities between texts. It's been noted how a number of common definitions would agree on elements of value, newness, and effectiveness. However, the majority of opinions would almost always diverge towards varied theories applicable to different practices, individuals, or domains. So people start, they go, this is what creativity is, and then they go, here's my practice, let me tell you all about it. Right? So they say, yeah, it's, it's, it's new, it's open, whatever, right? And then they go, but this is what it actually is. This is my report on it. This is what it is. And I think it's seemingly this flexibility and cross-disciplinary value of the subject which actually inhibits our ability to collectively agree on it because it's so valuable in lots of different walks of life, lots of different domains, lots of different disciplines, and we all understand it by our own kind of study on it. And that kind of damages the ability to get a consensus on what the subject actually is because there's so many different voices and so many different opinions. Within advancing creativity theory and research, a socio-cultural manifesto, 20 scholars, I believe a number of them are here, collectively agreed upon creativity as a psychological, social, and material phenomena. So that means it's in here, it's in here, and then it's in the doing as well, right? So that's very broad. It's culturally mediated, relational, meaningful, fundamental, Dynamic in meaning, dynamic in practice, an expression of similarities, an expression of difference, and a need of specification, right? That's inside the definition of what creativity is. It's in need of defining. It seems a bit uh, redundant within that context. But I want to look at similarities and differences, right? They're kind of the same thing when you get down to it. Um, but if the manifesto kind of highlights each individual's unique and different interpretation of the subject as a key element of what constitutes creativity. So stuff like perspective yesterday, understanding the way that you're different to people and understanding that you have a different opinion to them and they have a different opinion to you, that could be what creativity is really, our own expression of our difference, our opinion on a specific subject relevant to space, context, time, discipline, upbringing, blah, blah, blah. There's numerous languages, cultures, codes, and understandings at work here, right? So we all come from different backgrounds, we all come from different disciplines, we all understand creativity on our own terms. And I think to progress creativity research, we need to start expressing creative findings in ways that can be commonly understood rather than unanimous, agreed upon definitions. It's more stuff that are a bit more vague and you can take information from that and apply it to your own specific domain. Because we need research in music, we need research in arts, we need research in neuroscience, but we also need those findings to be easily communicated to people from different disciplines. So you go, yeah, I've made this amazing discovery about creativity but also the artist can take as much away from that as a businessman coming to a creativity conference, right? 
So if creativity is uniquely interpreted person to person, our research should present understandings that allow for this. With this in mind, it's not beyond reason to conclude that creativity can be an expression of self within context. So you're going, this is what's around me, this is what I do, this is what I think creativity is. But that is creativity, the fact that it's different from person to person. So that's not to say that there aren't agreements. We have industries, domains, disciplines. They can all be considered collective agreements on what creativity is within established context, right? So these allow creativity to be perceived, recognized, and valued. It's best demonstrated through creative practice theory by Chink Sent Mihai. It's the domain, field, and individual. So the individual presents an idea to the domain. The field, the people around go, yeah, that's a good idea. We accept that. So it kind of illustrates that creativity isn't just on the individual. It's reliant on all the individuals then agreeing upon what a good idea is and what a good idea isn't. It may be why in, just in the keynote um, this morning, going, it's quite difficult to discern eminent creatives, right? eminent creatives in the field, people who are really good at producing lots of creative ideas. It's probably because the creativity isn't coming from them per se, they're doing the output, but it's then perceived by the people around the eminent creative who collectively agree, yes, that is a good idea. So it's a culturally mediated act in that respect. So this interaction is crucial in instigating the realization of creative ideas. So you don't just need the individual, you need all the individuals. So if creativity cannot be separated from its recognition, is it then a subject that by nature needs to be observed to exist? So if a man is creative in a forest, was he really creative at all? <laughs> it, there's not a single series of mental steps that comprise creativity. Everybody's process is different. So the idea of ethnography would be, well, we observe lots of different creative practitioners in lots of creative uh, roles, domains, disciplines, not just the arts, but everything, science, medicine, um, therapy, whatever. You take your, take your pick. But from there, if we observe enough people and collate enough information from enough talented researchers, we can bring that together and start to discern common threads and similarities between people that might highlight the core characteristics of what it takes to achieve creativity. So not what creativity is, but what are the things that facilitate its existence and what are the things that encourage people to achieve it. So ethnographic observation of individuals across a number of fields could discern some of those idiosyncrasies that persist across domains, therefore better understanding what it takes to achieve creativity, right? So ethnographic reports on creativity would help encourage the free flow of creative processes just in their material existence. If you record someone painting a picture or record someone making a chair, someone can read that and know how the chair is made. But in doing that, in an ethnographic sense, you can look at the context, you can look at the workplace, like the homework earlier, defining a workplace that encourages creative action. You see that in the best chair makers, if you were to do that, for example. You can physically record and demonstrate uh, things mentioned in the manifesto I mentioned earlier, things like similarities, differences, actions, constructs, frames work, frameworks that define creative action, and collective understandings. Even as going as far as the dialectical learning, so, what someone does, a, ch a manufacturer of a chair might have a specific process that I don't share as an anthropologist. However, I might be able to learn something about myself from what I don't do by what they do, if that makes sense. So similarities in terminology insinuate ethnography's inherent similarity to creativity. They're both iterative and inductive, so they both evolve through the doing and the reflection of the doing. So you look, what did I just do? That's what, cre that, I was just creative. That's what creativity is. I was just creative. I can then continue doing that over and over again. One's a phenomena, so creativity we define as a cultural phenomena. The other is literally designed to observe them. They both have a need to ignore preconceptions and avoid seeing things through just one specific lens. So that could be understood as our different kind of research methodologies in this room today. And both have a mutual need for self-reflection and awareness of inhabited space. There's also a reliance on ideas developed by context, experience, and interaction. So again, the individual, the space they inhabit, their past, their historical context, and also the interaction with not just the materials, but the people around them. So with that in mind, I believe there's a natural link between the research methods and the area of study that will hopefully encourage a methodology that is self-aware, reflective, and thorough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions?
Thank you. That, that was wonderful. I, I, I wish we would see more ethnographies of, of creativity. And I, I think you made a very beautiful case of how the method and what we're talking about have deep similarities. I have, I have a, a small challenge that is my own personal challenge as well. And I, I'm happy you're an ethnographer here and, and talking about this. Um, so there are multiple perspectives. And, and I think you captured this multiplicity. But of course, we live in a world where not everything goes. And we know that some perspectives can actually be more harmful than others. So while we celebrate that diversity of perspectives. There is an issue of ethics and choice. How, how does ethnography deal with that aspect? I believe there's a good case for curation in that respect. So understanding what am I saying by choosing the specific people that I choose to observe. Um, that's a whole other set of issues that I hope to work towards um, because the ethics will have a big interplay of, well, me presenting that is presenting a perspective and an agenda. Um, so I've also played with the idea of allowing other people to select individuals for me to talk to. So this is a great networking opportunity. I'm sure all of you know different creative people and have practices yourselves that you would like to be observed. Um, so if you have ideas for that, I would like to be the researcher, but I would like other people to go, well, it's a collaborative process, right? If people contribute to that, I luckily avoid the kind of ethics of the decision and who I choose to present, and it's more a community-led idea of, well, we're collectively agreeing what we want creativity to be looked at, but hopefully in a balanced way, yeah? Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And what, what I see in, in what you, are, uh, what you uh, say is a sort of virtual circle uh, between uh, different kind of approaches. So uh, using the ethnographical observation, you can make or formulate new hypotheses that can be tested in, with cognitive science, social science, and again and again, uh, uh, giving, this could give new insight on how you can observe and then again, is, it could be included in a virtual circle. Yeah, hopefully. I think a lot of the stuff sitting in here yesterday and this morning looking at um, people doing the neuroscience and the psychology of creativity, um, there's definitely need for more um, painting of contextual color and information. Um, but similarly with my work, there's a lot more need for analytical data and analysis. So I think that community kind of needs to work together and bridge those gaps so we're checking each other. So I'm not just going away and doing flowery looking at people and you guys aren't just sitting in a lab going, well, this is where it happens in the brain. We go, this is where it happens in the brain and this is where it happens in the experience. And I think that would be a really nice thing to happen. Thanks. Lewis, thank you so much. Yes. So we're continuing with our final speaker of this session. We have a little, little change in the setting. So I will just start uh, introducing uh, the speaker. Uh, Patricia Elton is pursuing her PhD uh, in educational organizational leadership from North Central University, California, holding a master's in education from National University Sacramento in, on two concentrations, US education in global context and e-learning and teaching. She also holds a bachelor in social sciences, community development and leadership from Oregon State University. Patricia has a grassroots background with executive leadership roles in public policy and legislative reform. Patricia, the floor is yours. Okay, let's begin with where I, I call conversa conversation is creativity, creativity is conversation. Our last speaker even talked of the dialectical nature. We have, I, when I started my study, I wanted to know, I'm supposed to teach creativity, how does education define it? Because I know how it's defined in architecture, I know how it's defined in other areas of my, my practices. But I found that they could not agree. That got questionable for me, but they all used metaphors. So I said, okay, how can I find some ancient history of creativity? What did the ancients say? Thank you, Vlad, who sent me a study that worked with history, the ancients through reformation, the, the industrial age, and then of course I added high technology and 
its influence on, on creativity. But I went further because no, when I saw that you had gone to Confucius, calling it an expression in the evolution instead of revolution, of the personal evolution, then I went, what did the Vedas do? <laughs> so I went in and found another study by Reina, and she claimed that creativity defined in the ancient text was the word vak, which meant word. Kind of fits a lot of the Judeo-Christian understanding too, you know, first there was the word, you know. But Veda is the unitive view. So how can we define creativity in a way that unifies all of our disciplines? And I began to think about it, and it's after I did all the research, I felt it revealed itself in, in the 30 to 50 pieces of literature that I looked at. That really, creativity is a conversation between the, uh, what we cannot explain and what we can manifest. It's, it's to me, the intangible, we can't touch it yet, to the tangible and sometimes consequences. So if we look at that as the umbrella under which all of our domains and study how some of the other uh, disciplines, when asked, are you creative? A scientist says, no, I'm a problem solver. I'm thinking, my God, you're so creative. Um, that you are design thinkers. Y you innovate inventions to solve problems. That's a form of creativity, that's another definition, but it's not a change in the overall unitive value. You talk about something that's intangible, a problem. You define it. You build it into a design to solve it. You collaborate. You sometimes immerse in it, as does the Vedas. They immerse in the word until it manifests into something. And the unitive view, I'm using more towards the Native American idea of the circle, because we all come from our disciplines. So I'm giving these symbols because I'm gonna turn this around in a second. So the domains I say we're in our boxes. And when we step out of our box or we diverge, some of us like me who never stays in this very long, walks over and finds out what the Native Americans are doing. Goes over to ethnography. Because as a land use planner, in my background, I had to work with scientists and architects and creative people, and then the, op the, the, the person wants to have a window that faces the south wall, and I have to create what works and whether the land will support it. So I'm involved in many, many disciplines to solve problems, and I see the value in all of us. So I also see how we orient, and when asked to be creative, we talk to an accountant, and they're already figuring out the intangible cost. So you may not get a good answer from the orientation you're speaking to in that phase of creativity. As it moves through innovation, as it moves through social justice, you get pushback because different domains cross over and block like a boulder in a river. So we have to teach and immunize creative thinking from the, from the obstacles. We sometimes have to learn how to move a little more like water, which I tend to do. All right, so when I invert the circle, it becomes engagement. Still a circle, it's just a little different. And so when we begin to engage with one another, that's where conversations come, that's where exploratory thinking comes, that's when we set aside our orientation for a moment simply to understand the orientation of the speaker. It's okay to be open to them. And it's also okay to maintain your own orientation because that viewpoint will refine the subject matter. So we're free. We're free to engage and we are free for the free flow of information. Now, if you are a person who only processes for your own evolution, this process would be towards a higher consciousness. It would be the up and down inverted circle between your higher power and your, and your problem or your understanding of something. So understanding these ideas, and I turn this around. This is collaborative learning. <laughs> 
This is the creative conversation. This is creativity is conversation. We come from our domains, and I have domains here that would be problem solvers, design thinkers, sciences, technology, facilitating mediation people, the social justice, their public policy. You move towards collaborative learning facilitators and, and that whole concept. They're systems thinkers, they're adult education, they're negotiation. So they kind of, they start to blend with each other and the talents move with it. And then in a project-based or act, what I call co-activity, that builds community cohesion, peace building, it brings in mentorship and apprenticeship oracy. Really good for the workforce. Because when you start a project with someone, you have some that just learn by doing and some learn by watching. And they can work together. You can now assess mentorship from mastery, whether they can teach it or whether they're still in the apprenticeship phase. And that's a, oracy is probably one of the greatest skills we can give the workforce. But that's intercultural oracy, that's nonverbal communications, and then we can start learning from different cultures as we collaborate on a project together. Now, when I talk about the Native American aspect, because I have been with herds of white bison, that's been quite an experience for the last 10 years, and I've learned from many cultures, about the significance of their folklore slash mythology, but by the way, their herd is here, so their prophecy is real. Okay, so um, in their world, they have a medicine wheel, and I, don't, I do not speak for the Native American people, and that would be an insult if I did, because they speak for themselves. But I understand it in a prayer wheel point of view, and I understand it from how I was, it was explained to me without quoting them. So this is my perspective. They said that everyone came planted into the clay. The, the black clay, the seeds were planted first, the people's seeds were planted first, then the yellow clay, then the red clay, and then the white clay. And all other races are a combination of those colors. And in its totality, the medicine wheel that they operate from, when they point to the north of a people's, they're speaking of their wisdom their wise use of fire in a snow area, their, their food areas to the south, uh, making sure you're meeting the needs of the people. To the east, they look at the future. The sun rises in the, in the east, you have a plan for the day. It may not turn out that way, so when you come to the western gate, you meet all the people that, control, that have the knowledge of all the nation of nations. They gather the knowledge of the medicine people, and they say, what have we learned? What have been our life lessons? And with using our life lessons, what can we bring to the circle? If an elder comes in, they're gonna sit on the east because of all that they've learned, they might have some good advice for the future. Um, so if you looked at Turtle Island or America, in their perspective, the eastern gate where the future comes are the Cherokee. When you go to the north where the snow in those areas are, you get a different you get a different value. Um, but the Hopi are the heart. They take the blanket away from the person in the north and they hand them a cotton shirt. Or do, do you have a blanket? They say, we don't really care what your future brings, what your past is, have your needs been met today? So it's, it's a different way of forming collaborative learning in a community. I call it the third space between all of us. So the third space where both the native teachings and indigenous teachings can combine. Now, could it be positive or negative? Yes. When you operate in any culture, there are declining energies. There is, hey, let's all have a drink. Let's all have wine. It's the culture of Italy. Well, I can introduce you to a lot of people that have that problem in Oregon with the beer, but they're also in detox centers, and we don't have all the solutions. Okay, so we can't always think that way in the negative spiral or the underlying intentions would be in the lower area. Your purposes would be towards your higher ground or your higher consciousness. And so your arts, your music, your poetry conveys both negative spiral and positive spiral. And in between, in this helix, there are intersecting points where when you're having a conversation with someone, you can at that moment transition it back to a positive spiral. 
So it's a way of communicating a little differently when we know we all come from our orientation. I'm a businesswoman, I'm a planner, I'm a future thinker, I solve problems, and I step to the table for the purpose of making a significant contribution to humanity. And I would say that everyone in this room does. But I also come from the orientation, I like mountains and rivers. So I think in flow, I think in growing a mountain, and I think in the trees and watching the, the waters come by me. I don't have to be in the middle of the river to know that it's all coming by and grab the minerals as you need it. So it's another way of thinking. But with the complex problems that we have today, we need all of us. We need the scientists to open the creative left brain and then teach us how we use frequencies to explain serendipity. <laughs> is, it, is it that we envision something and move forward and we bring it to ourselves? Uh, who knows, that's a question. But the important part is, think of this collaborative learning center in your libraries, your school programs, in your laboratories, make them multidisciplinary. And for the low-tech people in the rural areas, we're still using this because we don't have Wi-Fi. Okay, <laughs> so I would say, we can do this together, but let's do it with smaller steps and, and take steps together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Questions? Um, thank you. That was fantastic. If you had just one piece of advice you'd like to give to us then, off the back of that, just one thing that we could all take away today, what would it be? What would, what would the takeaway be for yeah, today? Yeah, what would the one, just the one sentence takeaway? Um, openness to explore. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So next we will have lunch and we will uh, continue at 2 o'clock with a keynote of Roni Reader-Palman.